Welcome in, every, in, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, RFQ Refugees Podcast. Ted here, John here. We are finally made it. Feels feels like uh, feels like maybe we we never left, but it's been a an interesting off season, I'd say the least. But we're finally almost here. We're almost here to some MLS games. Before we get into that, John, how are you doing, my friend? How's your how was your weekend? Uh, the this is the little behind the scenes thing for everybody listening right now. It's Sunday, February eighteenth, and it's still the weekend. Yes. We're doing this on a late Sunday night. Uh, how was it? It was good. I you know I don't think you know what did I do? I was it was like the last weekend before soccer. I watched a lot of college baseball. Uh, that's, kinda, that's, <laughs> that's like, there's like a period before spring training starts where there's college baseball and I watch a whole bunch of it and then I never watch any of it again once major league baseball is available <laughs> to me. So I'm like, Oh, college baseball. Sweet. Um, yeah, but that's about it. I don't know. What about you? Did you, have any, did you get anything fun this weekend? Nothing actually really fun. It was kind of a quiet weekend watching, uh, just watching soccer, hanging out and, um, trying to. Trying to get ready for the MLS season, I'm excited for it. I'm, we had we had some we've had some not some open cups, some Concacaf Champions Cup games have started. I feel like that's like the first real kickoff when you start seeing those games, and we'll have some this uh, this week as well, along with the start of the season on Wednesday. So I'm excited. The um, more weeks though, off for us, Ted. We're we're back to the we're back to full. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. every every week forever until the end of time, and then uh, Patreon every other week. So if you missed us, we'll, we'll go ahead and drop this. Uh, this, this Sunday night will we'll carry into the first uh, the first weekend of the season as well. So we, we will probably record Sunday night. I have to travel Monday, and so I will be unable to record Monday night. Um, I think that was the situation for John uh, this week. So we're we'll, we'll get back to your live shows. We know you guys. You know you guys love love the live shows. You love to drop us into the chat. Um, but yeah, man, we're going back to week. We got the season starting. We got games to talk about. We haven't been able to see any DC United preseason games. I held out hope. I held out hope, uh, this past weekend that maybe, maybe, you know, MLS was going to be trialing, you know, some of the more broadcasts, but I guess they got that all figured out. They did that so. last year. So they know how they know where all, they know where to plug in all of the wires and whatnot. So it, it's, it's whatever, but the, I, I, I don't know if we're going to talk about this. Like we've got, we've seen no, no games. And like the very little bit of video we've seen, we're both like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> I wish we had seen no video. I'm I'm I don't want to have seen this little bit of video that we have. Well, there was there was some good to start uh, against the Sudanese national team. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're right. We should have just done that one game. That's the only game. We done. That's uh, our level. We'll, we'll get into it in a minute. I, I'm not you know, I, I don't know how this uh, how this year is going to go. It's a, it's very up in the air. Um, yeah, it's. I, I remember one uh, just what last bit of preseason like results conversation. I remember back in the day, like a long time ago, uh, when you could see all these games. Usually, there was a correlation between them doing really poorly uh, in the season if they did great in preseason, and vice versa. And then all of a sudden, it didn't. It decorrelated, and it would just be bad. <laughs> like it didn't make a difference. <laughs> like that's that's just been like since twenty eleven or twenty twelve. There's been some rogue good seasons in there, but typically. It's just been bad all the way through. There's not been they've not gone like four and zero and five and zero in preseason in a long time. But that used to that used to be a like the the forbearance of a of a, of a uh oh season, but not anymore. Hey man, <laughs> 2000, 2010 uh, Carolina Challenge Cup champions, whatever the whatever that tournament was called in the South Carolina, cup, the Coffee Pot Cup champions. Yeah, they won the Coffee Pot Cup, and that was like the only trophy they won that year because they were awful. But yeah, I agree. I mean, I think it's still it still holds true that preseason results don't always mean. Um, I, I guess I'm a, I'm a little worried, you know, I think back to last preseason, I think we, Ted Pietro really like emerged onto the scene and that was, yeah. and that was kind of maybe an indication of, oh, he's, he's here to play. He's, he's ready to go. Uh, Jackson Hopkins the year before that earned himself a contract for his performance during the preseason. My biggest concern is I don't know whether we've had that right now. And I don't know if it's a nature of the team, you know, trying, uh, you know, I, and I think Troilo Saints talked about it a little bit and we'll get into it in a minute, but I mean, he seems like he's very much wanting this team to sort of, you know, regardless of how these preseason games go, we're sticking to our plan. I want you guys to get comfortable in this system. When we have a real game or we have a couple games, maybe we'll adjust a little bit or maybe we'll, we'll go against some of that. But right now I, I don't really care. That's um, a guy not being judged on results. So mm-hmm. the, 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 that's why you can say that. And then that's fine for what this team is right now. Fine. Mm-hmm. Great. And what this team is trying to do. And we're going to have to admit, but let's start with, we've got, uh, we've got a signing to talk about. Yeah. Yes, indeed the, we do. <laughs> maybe not the most, not, not an exciting signing. I know there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of people, you know, 
decrying. I call them a, call them a create a player signing, uh, <laughs> a, a, a auto generated name. Diving into the into the scouting, it's when you hit the the scout button and, yep. and you like, go for I don't like, know, the is good? <laughs> uh, Connor Antley, uh, center center back slash right back wing back for the uh, Tampa Bay Rowdies. Uh, he uh, terms were not disclosed. I don't know if it was a financial financial parts were exchanged. Terms. So he's got a two year. Well, the the contract at least was disclosed. He's got a, a two year contract. He has a, is it a two year with a with a uh, option? option. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be for twenty twenty four, twenty twenty five. So, 20, 24, so I would have maybe liked a year, but maybe he would have said, "No, I'll stay in Tampa. Uh, give me, give me, give me at least two years guaranteed on that contract before I come." I, I'd be I, what I'm more curious is whether the team paid any sort of transfer fee to to Tampa Bay. A lot of these USL teams, as a reason, they don't get transfer fees is because they have something in their contract that says, "Hey, if an MLS team comes hunting, you know, you have to basically release me for free." It's becoming less common now, but I think maybe in, in Connor's situation that might have been on his contract. But um, so it was very, it was very. I think Stephen Goff posted undisclosed transfer terms. It, it seems to me that if if there was a transfer fee exchanged, it would have it would have said it. So um, you know, I, I think this is sort of representative of the team needs the team needs depth uh we've learned now that steve burnbaum is is out uh for at least a three to four weeks um the team needs depth they have no depth behind aaron herrera uh, they have pedro santos behind muhammad yaz but then that's really it so this team was def- desperate for depth that being said based on everything we've heard and again we do not watch the usl um the uh, guy that runs, and I really should credit his name. And in fact, John, I'm going to let you maybe jump in while I go find the guy's name. I want to make sure. John. Get... Yes. I know I know that much. I, I think what I think what we should have just done is traded them a Hayden Sargis. Like that's sort of what this was. <laughs> like he's he's the new he's the new Hayden Sargis. Like, all right, well, maybe this will work. And then it didn't. And then we got a new one. Maybe this will work. But to your point, he's a body. He exists. Uh, and that's that's really what he's got going for him, uh, I think, right now. Do you and- find it yet? And no, uh, and you know, to, to state it's that he, he's a body. Um, he is USL, and certainly that doesn't always, uh, that doesn't always translate. John Morrissey, uh, by the way, is his name. John Morrissey, thank you. Uh, so that that doesn't always translate. Um, you know, to to the to the MLS, it is a step up, certainly. But you know, I, I think there's still there's still plenty of avenues and it's not like they're getting a guy you know somebody i think like hayden sardis was kind of maybe a guy with some potential that maybe oh, well, maybe there, there'll be something here and I he think was they, starting ironically john morrissey was data was an analytics guy for both sacramento republic and tampa bay so it is no it is no wonder that he had a lot to say about this player because he probably watched him at some point yeah uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. I think that this guy is, I guess, the finished article by age. He's been here a little while. He's, you, you know, what to get out of him. Yeah. I mean, we shouldn't spend too much time. If this guy is on the field, uh oh, like if this guy's playing major minutes, we don't want that. That's not, that's not necessarily what we want with this signing. I, he's I good. I mean, if he's good, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I, I agree with you. I think he's depth. I'm not sure it's a, the plan is for him to really play. If, if he's starting, then yes, it means Aaron Herrera has suffered a tremendous, a, tr- Which tr- is not good. a, a horrific injury, and because <laughs> we paid a lot of money for him. <laughs> yes, yes, we did. So I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll walk that back. I, I think, I think he's there. But he is, you know, just to give some stats that he dropped. Um, if you go check out, go check out, go check him out on Twitter. I believe he writes for Backheel.com. He is uh, 80, 82% percent on uh, percentile and expected goals, eighty two percentile and expected assists. He's a guy who likes to push forward. Um, so he's a player. It, they showed a nice little clip of him sort of starting a counterattack from all the way from the back and then sort of pushing it up into the attack. And um, so he's a guy who certainly likes to to get forward. And I think he, I think at the very least, he will. He seems like a good fit as far as what this team is trying to do with pressing, with trying to win the ball, to move forward, to move quickly. So. I think for that he's a fit. Whether he's good or not, we'll 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 see. I like that his expected assists are at the very top of the grid, and he had three assists. But that's because he played it as a center, as a center back. <laughs> so that's, but, so. But he also, I mean, obviously he can play it right back too. Uh, but if he does more than not, then you want to see that number a little bit higher, probably. So they probably mixed him around last year. Yeah, and I think ver- right. I think ver- versatility is also probably you know a, a big part of this. It's the Drew Skendrich. You got to have yeah. a, you got to have a. You <laughs> traded Chris Durkin. You don't have any more Swiss Army knives. You need more guys that you can like pit, put in five positions. Yeah. So I think right now he, he, he the depth suits the right wing back position, but we'll see what happens with the other ones. And we're looking at a four man back line. I think I thought maybe we might see a three man back line, um, but based on the, I'd say the last game, it looks like we're 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 sticking with the 
with the four man with a four with a four three two or four two three one. I think is what we're what we're looking at this season. Um, other squad updates that maybe we weren't around. Brandon Parrish, uh, who was their second round draft pick, I believe. Uh, Clemson, maybe. Yep, out of Clemson, not offered a, a a contract after spending the time with the team in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Graham Jones, these returning to the academy, but could still be a homegrown signing. Again, we already talked about uh, injury updates. I, and I guess anything we want to drop there, it's who knows. <laughs> nope. <laughs> who knows about the, those two players? Um, uh, Steve Birnbaum uh, with the injury updates out three to four weeks with the had knee surgery. Um, yep, yeah, scope. Um, so we'll see what that is. And Russell Knauss also doubtful for the home he's opener. Confir- he's confirmed out, by the way. Russell okay. Knauss is now confirmed out uh, for the opener and maybe in subsequent weeks as well with an ankle. Yep. So now we get uh, we get Matty Matty Patola. Hope um, he's ready. <laughs> he's great. <laughs> <laughs> You're into the into the uh, into the firing frying pan for sure. Uh, I think I said on the Friday show like we you know we obviously put the hex on Knauss by saying man he had an Iron Man season last year. Like, <laughs> and then the, the first uh, the first opportunity to play is like oh he's out he's hurt. Unfortunately, yeah. not. Yeah, I, I don't know what we think. Steve Birnbaum out. I, I mean, a lot of fans. You talk to them, they'll say, <laughs> "Wait till you hear my prediction for 2024." Oh, Steve Birnbaum. Ooh, here we go. Here we go. Um, but uh, but Steve Birnbaum out. Uh, you got to think. You know, this is you're gonna have Chris, probably Christopher McVay and and Bartlett. I'm gonna guess are gonna be the center back pairing. Um, let's say Akinbony in there. We'll get into a little bit. Maybe about him from the last preseason game. From the highlights we've been able to see. Um, again, let's go and jump into it. Preseason game, two nothing loss to FC Dallas. Um, I know Paul Ariola had the second goal. Um, goal on an assist for Paul. Yeah, the, the team. Okay, yeah, we're, we're looking at it before um, before a certain Discord member gets upset at us. Yes, we know we're looking at uh, we are looking at video coverage. We don't get a chance to see the whole game. I think we saw like one potential chance that DC United had, in which Pirani. Was it a shot or a cross? Who knows? Uh, but it somehow found. I couldn't tell who was on the end of it. I guess on the other end, but across, across the. But a, as John apparently as someone upstairs. <laughs> yeah, I've got. I've got. A, I don't know what's going on. Something's going. On. We're <laughs> no, seven o'clock. is not our normal recording hour. So the the whole house is awake and things are happening. Sorry. Yeah, fair fair enough. But um, but yeah. So but I think what, one thing we noticed from the videos is. And one thing I'm taking away is I'm a little. I think this team might struggle a little bit handling like a quick transition team, and I think that's what we saw in this game. Is you know the the first goal. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that the DC had some sort of set play, either a free kick, corner kick, something like that, because the uh, there were no. I believe it was Herrera and um, and the new guy Antley sort of tracking back, but there wasn't any any defenders that I could see. McVeigh wasn't there. Bartley wasn't there. They were probably all pushed up to try to win a header um, on on a set piece. And the team got completely burned and caught out. Uh, very nicely worked goal, um, but yeah, that that didn't look good. Aren't you so excited that starting next Saturday we're going to be able to draw conclusions on <laughs> actual oh like God. non non subpruder like cell phone coverage of a, of a one angle behind the goal? And we're like, we're going to draw conclusions. <laughs> we're going to do. We're going to do some analysis. But no, I mean, I am very excited to actually watch this team play. And you know, I you know, I'm not I'm not feeling super confident. I think Burnbaum being hurt is going to be a big problem with this back line. We got four new guys that are just sort of figuring out where the keys, where they put their keys and, you know, where the locker room is. Uh, But, you know, it's here. So we can at least be happy about that. But this game, I think you, the only thing you can draw from this probably is that that is likely our first choice lineup. What you saw as the 11 there is what we're probably going to see barring injuries against New England on Saturday. I would, I would, I would suspect. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think it also is an indication. I think I think Stroud started sort of on that right side, um, sort of to the and then it was sort of the you talk about the four, two, three, one. You had, uh, you know, Matty Peltola and uh, Mateus Click kind of in that sort of that holding midfield role. I imagine Peltola is probably going to occupy uh, a lot of that sort of defensive side of the ball, sort of the canals role. And then Click will be able to sort of have more freedom to push forward. Uh, Stroud also appears to be that he has sort of won the the yep. right wing back spot away a right the right side spot so he won it from um from Martin Rodriguez and I think that's significant because you're talking about there are certain players on this roster Dahomey Rodriguez Dahomey also could have been an option as well um where are they going to fit into this team or where they, how are they even going to be on the roster or considered being on the Martin's roster? a left sided player right you might be right I think he right. I think he so he would be over there I think the question is like there was you know where do you how do you get uh, uh, Pirani and Ted Cudi Pietro and 
Benteke and Rodriguez and somebody like in, in that. And that's, I guess what they're going to do Stroud. I feel like Stroud winning that spot is not altogether exciting. I think Stroud, you know, yeah, I think last year in St. Louis had 10 goal contributions, which is great. I think that's a, a high for him. Uh, it's certainly not, it's, it's like, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It's like when I, it's, I don't want to stop bringing up Ulysses Segura and Drew Skendridge, but it's like where you find this player who is like, not going to wow anybody. He's not, you're, you're not going to, you're not going to be like on a winning team. This guy is not a star, but you want to have a guy that you can depend that he's going to be a seven out of 10, no mm-hmm. matter what. I feel like maybe that's him. And I think that there isn't enough depth on the wings either side to really turn our nose up at that, I guess. It's just not exciting. It's just not like, you know, <laughs> when we saw that trade happen, you're like, well, well, he's good depth. Great. Good. Jared Stroud. <laughs> and then he's like, oh, no, he's going to start game one. All right. Well, that's fine. Yeah. So I, I you know, again, we could get some curveballs. I think maybe they're also I, I'd be curious to see. I believe Antley started that game. I'm wondering if that was just we need to see some minutes. We need to see what we have with him. We need to see where he might fit. Um, I think it was interesting that he was out there and not, you know, Muhammad, Muhammad Jaws. I think or, he's, I think Jazz is still not fully fit. Yeah, it's possible. And they, he would, they said they were bringing him along slowly in camp. It would not surprise me at all if he's not ready to go. And it's not about, I mean, maybe I hope, you know, that's better. <laughs> it's better if the guy that you're paying like the highest left back salary in the league is available after last year, but maybe not. We'll see. Yeah, I, I think ba- I think basically if they are going with a four two three one and they do have Yaz out there and they do have Herrera out there, I think you're going to see both Stroud and uh, and Ted Kudipiacher obviously are going to play very narrow, and then they are going to sort of they're going to sort of play narrow and then they're going to sort of use their wing backs to kind of give them width. So sort of similar to I mean kind of what we saw with in the Hernan Lasada days of you know with Kevin Paredes out there and. And uh, I forget uh, Joseph Mora, maybe like just like giving getting your whip from your wing backs, you know, then you can kind of play through the middle. Um, so we'll see. Um, we actually have a game to walk about. We're not going to be speculating anymore. It's real um, great. So, I wish we had Joseph Mora still, by the way. Yeah, he's, he's in Costa Rica right now. He is and starting. Yeah. He's very dependable. He was always very. Think about <laughs> like if you had him as your second choice left back on this team right now, you'd be like sick i'm, I'm yeah. feeling good about that i'm feeling good about and then instead we're like jayaz and uh you know uh pedro santos <laughs> let's get into what we can preview about this home opener again i i don't think we've i mean maybe there were some revolution preseason games we could have watched but well, we're we, not gonna do that either <laughs> come on gonna, guys get out of here that, uh, uh but some interesting uh you know new coach caleb porter steps in um i think the general consensus is that the revolution still think this is their window um you're not bringing in caleb porter to rebuild or do anything he's just there to do a solid job obviously the storyline from last year i think is missed opportunity um this team was i don't i don't want to say they were rolling along under bruce serena but i mean they were i'd say you know top they were one top cup couple of the, of the conference they were doing quite all right i think yeah they were doing well and then of course the 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 whole unbelievable story of whatever bruce serena said which i don't know i think at this point we're just never gonna know if he never comes back we'll never know yeah. So, and I think it seems like teams don't even want to touch that Does. Um, in a lot of ways. We'll see what happens. Summer, summer, there might be some firings, might be some coaches gone. I think he's getting are. the Bill Belichick treatment. He's it, the New England coach that has no job, that the seats, the uh, musical chairs have gone and he's still standing just, just like, just like I, Bruce Arena. I will tell you, I will tell you, there is a coach on the hot seat in Atlanta. Um, the, uh, uh, shoot, I can't think of his name. I know we were looking to hire him as well. Can't think of him, but I, but I think Atlanta's a good, maybe a good shout out if, Things go really south there. They've got. They've also got a team that's in a window. Um, I was. Uh, well, I can't think of it. It'll come to me. Anyway, uh, let's get back to this. Uh, key departures for this team. Um, they have Gustavo Bo and Omar Gonzalez. They also had a goalkeeper that they signed that was supposed to be the Petrovic replacement, and he never played a minute. Uh, the goalkeeping <laughs> coach hated him apparently and didn't talk to him the entire time he was there. I read an article <laughs> by him. He's like. He's like, I don't know. I just practice. No one talks to me. I train on my own. By the way, the name on that you're looking for there is Gonzalo Pineda. Yeah, Gonzalo Pineda. Name, a name I also always forget. I don't yeah. know why. Again, know that we know that he interviewed here. We know that he played for the Sounders, and then my brain just gets ready. If I was doing like an MLS specific prediction, I would have said like by the summer, by the by Copa America, uh, Bruce Arena will be the head coach of Atlanta United after Gonzalo Pineda would be let go because I think he is one of those coaches that is on the hot seat. I think um, that's probably true. 
but big big departure I think is obviously Gustavo Bo. He's a he's a massive goal scorer for them, uh, massive massive player for them. Uh, but they do have some other players that come in. They have Henrik Ravas is going to be their new goalkeeper, so we're sort of dropping in replacing them. They also grab Nick Lima and uh, Tomas Shanagle, which is, I believe is one of their new players. Um, team again is in a championship window. I think they are. They think this is still their year. They're still trying to make the best of what they can do with the window. They obviously uh, one player, of course, I'm going to highlight is Carlos Gil, Carlos Gill. He is the still very good, <laughs> still very, very, very good. Um, go look at his FB ref. Go look at his FB ref and then compare it to uh, Gabriel Pirani and you will see a, a world of difference. Uh, one, one thing that catches my eye, he is a 99th percentile in shot creating actions. So um, I'm telling you, Pirani, you got to look at that because that's something you struggled with last season. And that's something you got to look to create. He's also 87th percentile in expected assist goals. He is a number 10 creator. He will be very, very difficult for this team to manage. He is for all, for all I know, he's healthy. Um, and then you have Noel Buck, who's the, who's another player highlight. I believe he's 19 or 20 young guy uh, for New England Revolution should, I think, probably potentially sold in this in the summer. I know there's been a lot of teams looking at them. 83rd percentile in tackles and 91st percentile in progressive carries. So he's a guy who likes to to move the ball forward and push it forward. So um, there's one other player that really we probably should be looking at. It's Esmir Bayrak Tarovic. I know that because I just looked at the pronunciation guide uh, in the <laughs> on their website. That is a he played. He was in the January camp. He got a couple minutes at the end of the season. They're very very high in him as yeah. well. Uh, New England, you know, you know, they don't have they're not known for sort of their homegrowns uh, historically, but they've got a couple good young players that they've signed. Noel Buck obviously has been in the consideration for the England, uh, I think, under 21 side. Uh, You've got Esmir. You've had every starting goalkeeper for New England basically get sold to a Premier League team basically in the last couple of years. So uh, they just keep on they just keep on recycling. I I imagine the guy you're talking about here, this uh, this Ravas guy is probably like, well, I'm clearly going to be Arsenal's goalkeeper in like a year or something if I just play here. (laughs) Or Chelsea. You never know. Or Chelsea (laughs) Chelsea certainly could have some availability when they go down the championship. Uh, Uh. (laughs) This this is this is certainly like you said. A team not in a rebuilding mode, a team that still very much in, imagines themselves in the conversation uh, to win the Eastern Conference. And, you know, I would be concerned at a team that, for the most part, other than Gustavo Bo, is the one player that I'm really concerned about uh, missing. And I think everyone's kind of healthy. Uh, a team that, a team like us right now, where we have a, whole, a wholesale new back line uh, in place and our starting defensive midfielders out. And we, you know, we're, we're sort of figuring out what we figuring out what uh, formation we're going to play. I think this could go badly in the first week. And I guess we could talk about prediction right from that. I would yeah. say I, I, I see a I see a three one loss. to <sighs> You know, and Veroni also, I think, is their striker that they're going to look to to probably be the bow replacement. Um, yeah, man. I, you know what? I was going to I was going to go with a draw. And you know what? I'm still going to go with a draw. Someone's got to be Ted, two two. Take two, the, two take, the <laughs> take the uh, take the optimism for uh, for you know here. you know here's the thing here's the thing DC United f- for the past few years always seems to perform I would say except with the exception of 2020 2021 2022 when we we didn't think they would be good they somehow managed to pull pull a game out where they where they go in and they and they either pick up a win or they pick up an unexpected result they get some momentum then the wheels kind of fall off I I think they benefit from the fact that. No one, they, their games aren't streamed. Their preseason games haven't been streamed. I think this is why they do it, uh, if I had to be honest, because they want to be completely as completely unknown as they possibly can. They'll, uh, you know, that's why they play FC Dallas. That's why they went to Saudi Arabia. They like, they literally want nobody to watch, be able to watch their games or to get any sort of tape on them about how they're going to play. And then they come out and they surprise people because coaches don't have really a game plan and they kind of have to adjust a little bit on the fly. That's my conspiracy a, theory for the day. I have a cynical take on the opposite end of that. It's that they don't show those because if they stink really bad, they want to make sure that they at least get one sellout in the year and it's the home opener. And if they if they if they, if they are hot, hot garbage zero and five uh, garbage fire, then they're like, oh, no one wants to come see this. So that's another good reason to keep it a secret. Okay. They weren't a garbage fire necessarily, as far as we know. It was, they, we weren't getting we weren't inter Miamiing it up. We were not losing six to nothing to to various sides. So there's that. We're, we're yeah. in the these were very uh, on brand results for this club, like compared to where we were. Right, like it's two a two nothing loss seems that seems right. That seems or a three one that seems reasonable. And there are going to be people in the chat 
or people in the comments, Instagram, Facebook, when this team, if this team does struggle, which we're, I think we're saying they're going to be, and I'll get into one of my, one of my specific predictions, which uh, I'm going to tease a little bit. It involves them potentially struggling um, out the gate. I think you're going to see a lot of that. I, I, I think we, I think what we need to ask ourselves as fans is, do we want a little bit of short-term pain for actually long-term vision, or do we want this club to do what they've always tried to do for the past few years, which has been cobble together, go out, you know, overpay for players, and then maybe we'll, we'll, we'll be okay. Like we'll be together, cohesive, but you know, we're, but then it's not going to be sustainable. It's going to fall apart at the end. There's no identity, no vision, and then we recycle all the way back again. I think this is this is going to be as close to a cleansing restart. It's going potentially to be rough, um, yeah. but I think. My hope is, is that by, you know, by, you know, May, May, June, maybe the team starts to put together some results. They start to hum a little bit. Um, you know, maybe they get a cup run in the open cup, though. We'll get into that. All that, all that mess that's going on in here in a little bit. Um, you know, that then they can, they can, they can start to, we can, we can enter the next off season today and like, okay, we have a base built and we can move forward. That's really what this is about. This is about building a base for this club. All right, let's do it. We got we got some specific predictions. I am borrowing from Total Soccer Show, uh, which I, they do a segment that I love, and I think it's I want to apply it just to DC. So here we go, John. First, a very specific prediction for the season: Steve Birnbaum will be the best defender on this club by all statistic metrics by the end of the season. Ooh, good one. I have one, and this is coming from my research I did on Matty uh, Peltola. Matty Peltola will lead the team in ground covered in 2024, so he will cover the most ground. You will look at the uh, whatever they have the the game maps of like how much, how much a player runs using those trackers. He will be top of the list. He's going to be all over the place. Click will be number two. I bet you. Yeah, I bet. I bet so. Uh, I also predict that one of our goalkeepers will be sold by the end of the season, probably in the, in the summer window, a club, a club will, a club will, will look for a, an option maybe with an injured player or, or something else going on and see that we have two players that could certainly fill that bill. Yeah, I have uh, Aaron Herrera will provide the most assists on Christian Benteke's goals. So what, what I'm saying by this is that when you add up all of Christian Benteke's goals, they're going to be assists. They're going to be played. The ball's going to be played from Aaron Herrera. I think he is going to. I think this team right now, I, especially after the way they're setting up, they're going to play very narrow. The ball's going to slip out onto the onto the wings when they want to get whipped, and he's going to be whipping balls in. And you have one of the best players at winning the ball. I think he's going to get a lot of headed goals. And it doesn't have to be all with his head. I think he can also find him with his feet as well. So um, next one. You got another one? Ted Cudipietro will be the secondary scorer this team has needed since Taxi Funtas left, scoring nine goals this season. Nine goals. Exactly. I have this one, which I think is maybe some fans won't like. Uh, DC United will have only one win in February, March, and that one win will come against Inter Miami. Here's my thinking behind. Look, if you look, if you, if you look at their schedule, so they got we already we're already chalking up either a tie or a loss for for a Revolution. Then they're on the road against Cincy. They're on the road against Portland. Those are going to be two incredibly tough games. However, however, I think what there's rumors that Messi might not even be there on the 16th. I think the other team on the list, when I looked at the risk that might struggle to start the year, I think is going to be Inter Miami. They're also going to be have Concacaf Champions Cup that they're going to have to start to think about. So then they're going to be juggling those types of things, uh, those those things that are uh, that type of uh, tournament, and that's a tournament they want to win. So I think they're going to play a little bit of a weak inside. I think DC will see it. There'll be a packed house there. They will be looking to prove something. I think that will be the only win they'll pick up in February, March. And then it kind of goes back to a little bit back to normal. So, yep. Last one. Biggest scapegoat of the year is going to be Gab- Gabriel Pirani. Yeah, Pirani is going to be much more of a Edison Flores than a Luciano Acosta. The numbers and the advanced statistics that everyone saw last year and looked to the other side and said this team was bad. So that's why his numbers are bad. Uh, it's going to be uh, the opposite of that. The back yields uh, stance on this player being a shut being a ball mover and not a chance creator is going to be correct. And we're going to have buyer's remorse. Do you think the team in the summer then get grab goes out and gets a number 10 or they just ride yeah. out to the air and restarts? I think they do. I think that they might, I think if they're looking at where they want to go from a DP perspective, that that might be. It depends. I, I think there's. We we know that Mateus Click and Christian Mateke are gone next year. They're going to have a. It's completely a blank slate on what they need to build. Uh, a nine will be part of this because if you look at this roster, one's not there. And I think a ten. If like to your point, if Prani is as I, is as I say he is, um, it's possible that they have to go elsewhere and spend the money. 
We'll see. You know, I I find you know Makai. Uh, you know, Makai talks interesting. I brought this up on the on the Friday show, but to mention it. Say it. Yeah, Makai talked a lot about analytics, or talked a lot about how this is going to be an analytic based team, and Pirani certainly doesn't fit that bill. And also, um, I think you were going to mention what what he said during there was a sort of a supporters group meet and greet. So yes. yeah, I'll let you so, I'll talk, I'll talk about that. So there was a question that comes up about what what is Dave Casper's reach on this team still, and uh, Makai was still trying to make it very very clear that it's his it's his team now, and he said that uh, Dave found out about the Pirani signing the way everyone else did on the internet. Uh, not because he knew that it was coming, which I think is very, it's kind of uh, uh, accidentally very telling, like this move is now on you, bud. So now like you can't, there's not even like a, you can't even be like, it was a group decision or, you know, like, you know, I, I just was taking the data that I got from it. No, this is you, man. This is, this is a player that you decided that you want to spend the transfer fee for. So I hope that you are right. And I hope that I am wrong. That's yeah. good. If I'm, if I am, if I am right, that's, that's super bad. I think mean, that's, to your point, like it's a not a huge transfer fee, but it is flying in the face of we're going to be a data first team. We looked at the data and we said this was the move. <laughs> yeah, I, I I still think this was. I don't have my group together. I don't even have the beginnings of scouting a number ten. This number ten is here. He's cheap. <laughs> if it if it blows up, it's like it's not at the end of the day not a significant amount of money, right? We, you know, we can, we, we still have the U22 slots to take in. I, I bet he knows too. He is going to. One other prediction I thought about making was like of the group of like Martin Rodriguez, Mahana Jazz, and Christian Dahomey. I said two of them will be gone by the summer and they will occupy the, the two international slots that they will then fill for U22 slots. Maybe great. I'll make that. That's a prediction I'm just going to come up with on fly. My other one is Christian Fletcher will be a regular starter by June. Inshallah. So, uh, I hope so. Yeah. I, I, so I, I think the fact that they are playing Stroud, me, and I think especially because if Stroud is the starter, you're right, he's going to be serviceable. I think it shows that the team he like. I think when 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 Lissane talked about guys that like maybe aren't as as into it, I think we can point the finger at Christian Dahomey. I think Dahomey is like, look, I'm on the last year of my contract. I'm not, you know, I they could exercise potentially a buyout on him. I don't think he's engaged. I think if you are if you're Lissane, you are gonna the first person off the bench is gonna be Christian Fletcher. I think maybe he shows something. He starts to build up some confidence. He starts to register some goals and assists, and then he completely takes over. I would have said maybe Matei Akambone, but I think the team has brought in too much depth. And center back, young center backs is hard. It's much harder, it's much easier to be a young attacker than it is to be young center back. But I could be wrong. I hope I, I, from the standpoint that we're turning around, turning away transfer fees for that player, I hope that they do have a plan to develop him and we're not just, you know, yeah. sitting on him for nothing. I, I think I think he will get I think he will get sub opportunities more than last season. I think he will start to be brought in in certain games, maybe when we're up. And I think I, I, the thing that gives me worried is the goal, the second goal. He plays a very soft square ball. This is in the Dallas game. And in the Dallas game. I can't see who the player that he tried to play it to, but it was not a good pass. And he, DC basically gets burned on the whole situation. Um, so I think there's still maybe a little bit of rough, rough, rough areas that they're trying to work with him. Um, so watch we'll see. Maybe the, the first, uh, first option off the bench what? for left wing back. <laughs> watch him be the goal. Which he played sometimes, which was yeah. part of the conversation about. And if we have, injuries he will see the field yeah and i think that's where he is right now i think it's like look we we let's get out there we'll we'll let you know if uh we'll we'll, we'll see see if he can prove something and but i, I think he's one player who's going to be definitely gone um let's, let's get into the bad vibes conversation <laughs> the bad vibes <laughs> there, there was our specific predictions um i i have mine down john i think you should put yours down we will save them off somewhere and then we'll review at the end of the year and see if we were right um I don't want to do that because I'm going to probably be wrong. So I'm going to forget to write, write those down. <laughs> you might be right on the Piranha some, thing. I don't some, know. <laughs> some listener will write them down for me. That's usually the way this works. Someone will somewhere, somewhere will have it be like a uh, a bet, a, a bet collection service. We'll figure it out. Yeah. But as we're saying, let's uh, we, we actually got just before the show started, got the, the text of what this is going to be. So uh, we talked a lot about the Saudi Arabian uh, trip, the why, uh, the how. We talked about the fact that this was money in the door. And we talked about that this was has been in the works prior to the coach and general manager coming here. And it's also something that they want to do into the future. So there's consequences for that. I think that there were people who felt very strongly about it. I said it on the Friday show. I was thinking about it. Uh, I knew that this protest was, was coming. Uh, and I was thinking like, 
you know, how did the, the, the players seem like they had a good time? The, the, the front office staff that was there seemed like they had a good time. And I was thinking, if not for a new job, the director of player personnel could have been in danger just for like being on the preseason trip. Uh, there, and he's probably not the only one, right? The, if, if Rory, if, if, if Rory were there as like a known individual who the club has featured frequently mm-hmm. as being like a, a, an out and proud gay guy in, in, this, in, the, in Washington, D.C. and in the MLS. And then they, you know, Saudi Arabia, is, it's not a it's not a secret like about how Saudi Arabia does handles those handles situations and, and how, you know, how how brutal it can be. Uh, in situations that are pretty benign, like Grant Wall wearing a t-shirt and all the things that sort of like that, that whole experience before, like that recontextualize how bad the decision-making was. Like it, it is, it's, it is a place that the state department is like, do not travel there. Uh, if you are, if you are like, if you're gay, don't go there. Like it's, I like it's just wild that that's the place we send out before it, you can sort of abstract that a little bit. Mm-hmm. When you think about like, oh, a lot of people are doing it. It's but, but then when you think about the human side of it, it's it's wild. And it was did not go unnoticed by fans, and they're having a response, at least the supporters groups. Yeah. Um for home games, uh, they will be no drums no, or chants, so it will be noticeable, I'm sure, in the in, in the atmosphere on the game. And um, you know, I support them. Uh that's me too. I think I think that is I think that's a good way to to, to slice this. And and I feel like we're all I think we're all struggling right now with the behaviors of, of major league soccer of, of MLA of, of DC United right now, especially DC fans are struggling. We're all struggling with this because, you know, many of us have been fans of this team since we were, I, I've been a fan since I was a kid. I've gone to games. I still have that connection. Those connections are very hard to, to separate. Um, and I feel like that's what a lot of fans are going through. It's, 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 it's hard to separate those and expecting a bunch of people to just suddenly accept. I, I hear the, you know, the, the pro rel crowd, all the people who yell about this type of stuff about how MLS is all about money. You know, they, they all say, you know, we, you, you should just separate. And I'm like, it's not, it's, I'm sorry. It's really not that simple. We, we dedicate a lot of time. You know, we want these teams to be successful. I think there are appropriate ways to respond when they do these types of things. And I feel like, I feel like if you're abandoning this, then you're abandoning, I'm sorry, the only soccer league that's been around and been successful. And we can argue about whether there's a better way to do this, but for right now, this is what we got. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it sucks in a lot of ways, but it's a part of a thing that I've noticed. And I'm not the only one to notice this. And other people have talked about it is like, everything is getting worse as a sports fan in this country. Like, like very recently, like the, obviously some of them matter more than the others, the open cup thing that is blatantly fan hostile decision or attempt decision making jerseys are getting worse in some sports. They're getting more expensive in other mm-hmm. sports. Uh, there are, there are issues still with streaming and consolidation of, 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 of those platforms. The cost of, of MLS uh, direct kick, not direct kick. I'm going to call it direct kick. Holy crap. Season pass didn't go up, but it's still, a, it's still a barrier for some people. Uh, things are just, in a continual way, little by little, bit by bit, making it harder to be a sports fan. And like, uh, like you're just like the, the, the relationship you have to that team becomes more and more purely one as a consumer. And it always has been to some degree, but Mm -hmm. like the artifice, the, the, the thing you construct between yourself and the product you buy has always been a story, right? You have this story of this connection of this community, all those things. And like, just, you know, just a cap, just a fanatics decision, a little capitalism here, a little decision to go to Saudi Arabia here. You're just like, man, it is, it is like more and more that story that I have been telling myself, I have to change. Like it has to be, maybe this doesn't have to be a central part of my identity anymore. Or like what I, you know, like my, the first thing I tell people about is that I'm a DC United fan or whatever it is, or a DC United podcaster in my particular case. And maybe it's going to be something else just because, you know, it's harder, it's harder to align those things with the way I view myself or, or any of, I think it's just, it's not just soccer. It's not just us. I think it's, Mm -hmm. I think you're seeing it all over the place. It's not good, Bob. Yeah. And you know, you talk about, I mean, I guess the one positive thing is like the the one thing I feel like you talked about kits getting worse. Jersey's getting worse. I mean, they're all good this year, by the way. Yeah. Like MLS are awesome. Like blew it out of the water. Like every single design. I mean, with maybe the exception of RSL, but, 
I mean, I will contend. I mean, you think about two years ago when they when they tried to get everybody excited about the white kits or the the clean look of the of the white jerseys. By the way, you can still buy that jersey if you want on no discount. I guess they're just like we're just gonna sink a a whole five of them from Target for for fourteen ninety nine. I was mostly from a jersey perspective. You not you don't follow as closely as I do, obviously, and I would expect you to. The baseball jerseys have been made by Nike via Fanatics. They everyone is mad about them. Fans are mad at them. Players are mad about them. It was clearly a decision about you know maximizing profit on these things. They shrunk the letters. They they ironed on everything that used to be sewn on. They moved the location. It, every, it, it looks you probably haven't seen it, Ted. It looks like the giveaway T-shirt jersey they give you, and these are the ones they're giving the, the players to play in. And like this is a joke. Why would they do this? And they made it more expensive. It's just like, but it is all, it's all of a, of a piece, right? Like, it's just like, well, how, how can we squeeze a little bit more out of this? Let's make this jersey cheaper, but then also charge more for it because, you know, inflation. Yeah. Other, sorry. sorry, Any chance to talk about baseball jerseys being shitty? I I want to take advantage of it. I'm not, it makes me crazy. I mean, I I follow a little bit of hockey, so I know the NHL is going through this as well. It's coming. They're coming next. Yeah, it's going to be. I just hope I I know MLS right now. Like right now, you look at fanatics and like all the DC gear is terrible. Like I look at yep. like gifts for like my my dad, for instance. And I look every year. I always check. Well, maybe there's something interesting. And I look. I'm just like, there's nothing. It's like custom <laughs> ink with DC United's logo on it. Like, yeah, it's it's like here's just, a g- generic brand item. Th- there's no there's no soul to it. There's no yeah. And I've seen some stuff on fanatics for other teams that looks really good. I think it's just a matter of who how, what the effort, what kind of effort is put in. Um, Anyway, uh, other sort of supportive news, uh, La Banda, uh, which I don't know if we really talked too much on the show, uh, but they are still uh, going to be not have not, they'll still be banned. So the I think like everyone who's in that group can still attend games. They just cannot have a presence in the supporters group. Um, and a lot of people are upset about this. I understand it. You know, they bring a lot of heart, and a lot of soul. Um, I say the reason the reasoning behind their ban yeah, is is legitimate and justified. Uh, guys, this is soccer. This is a sport. And don't throw rocks at buses. Yeah, don't throw rocks at buses. Don't do not do that type of stuff. Um, you know, it's... it's. I, I know we get into a lot of the sort of, you know, banning supporters groups and we, and we see ultra behavior and stuff like that. Um, people can... Like, instances where people can get hurt, like seriously hurt, that's where I think you you can you can kind of draw the little draw the line a little bit and say, nope, that's that's not something we want. So nope. I love MLS for the fact that the atmospheres at stadiums can be electric in a lot of places. I think that is what has led to the growth of the game. I think it's kind of waning a little bit as far as a, a part of a part of growing the the sport. Um, but I think it's still an, a great part of this uh, of this sport uh, of watching the sport. Um, so yep. Uh, new jersey, new black jersey, a new sponsor. As I think we've talked about, it looks uh, we all the jerseys look great. I think the DC yep. kit looks great. I'm really glad that I was worried. I was worried like the pattern wouldn't really show through, but it definitely does. Uh, I don't know if it'll show through on the field, but I'm fine with it not showing on the field. You know, we're we're a, we're a team that wears black. I like the way. What I love about the jersey, I do like the way the red. the The red is much more prominent. I think that should be a. It doesn't look like a black and white kit it looks like a actual so, black and red s- sides and bottom unless you're buying the replica kit and then no that's not the case <laughs> it doesn't have it's not on the sides it's expensive we talked about um guidehouse is the new also the new sponsor there's no more crypto which i think a lot of us are very happy about um five years seven and a half million dollar year sponsorship again the xdc bill deal was supposed to be for three for three years and then they announced a successful conclusion to that deal, which is translation for uh, this is no longer worthwhile for us. Crypto is, uh, although their coin, funny enough, like I looked at the trend line of their coin and it's like still up from it, when since they first they started. announced the the ending of the DC United partnership. Is that what shot it up? People are like, I don't oh, know. Finally, not associated. <laughs> it, with was, it, was kind, team. it was it was it was kind of, but it like it, it shoots up basically as soon as they announced the at the year that they sort of announced the sponsorship. Then it kind of went right back down. Crypto is 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 something that is crashing. So if I never hear the words XDC again, I will be, I will be very, very happy. All right, let's get into some league wide news. Let's talk about this news. This is why if you're watching on the video version, I am wearing my referee Jersey for the same, the MLS referee shirt. I didn't shirt. know that that was a referee shirt. I thought you were just wearing a green polo. Cause I couldn't see the button things. No, that's blocked. I couldn't see that. Oh yeah. I couldn't see <laughs> I was that. It's like, yeah. Hey, cool. It does. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't. Show I was through. expecting black and white stripes. Like, uh, like yeah, a high you, school come on, basketball. You want, no, referee. you want, you watch refereeing. You should know what kits, what kits. Sometimes they're, they're pink. Sometimes they're different yeah. colors. I could have grabbed, I, I grabbed the green one. I could have grabbed, I got a bunch of colors sitting right there. 
Bring do the whistle next time. You got a whistle that you can. <laughs> I was debating whether I could wear the patch. I was like, I don't want to wear the patch. I don't want to get in trouble. They they've got some particular wells, but I wanted to show some solidarity here with the referees uh, because uh, we're gonna have replacement referees, guys. Uh, this should be this could e- this will either go. I think there are two ways. This will either be fine. Twenty fourteen, they talked about how there was like an increase in mistakes, and my argument is that well, mistakes can be. There's varying degree soccer like mistakes are going to happen by the referees all the time. They're going to make a miss a miss call. It's going to happen just about every game. It's the degree of those mistakes that can be the difference. So if there's like if they're counting like an increase in mistakes being well, sometimes they call it a throw in wrong, or sometimes maybe they call it a foul in the middle of the field wrong. You know what? That that's not really somewhat of a big deal. So they were talking about concussion protocol stuff not being followed the right way. That was their big thing that they were drawing out as a thing, and that's fine. To your point, so you said the one way it could go is it could go fine. Mm-hmm. Or what? They could go really horribly. Or it could be fail Mary NFL territory, which if you're unfamiliar or maybe too young, um, because it apparently it, it has happened a while. It's been a while. Uh I don't know, I guess we ten years. It's been ten years. I can't remember how when when the NFL referee strike was. Uh but basically in in a game between the uh I think it was the Seahawks and the Packers, I think there was a Hail Mary play at the end of the game that was very clearly intercepted and would have been called intercepted. But you had two referees go in. One says one said touchdown and the other one said interception and they went with the touchdown play. And it actually, it sort of galvanized uh, and it gave the, the referees at the time what they wanted, which was a massive mistake that sort of forced the NFL back to the table. So um, for those of you who maybe not be aware, there was a tentative agreement. It looked like all this was kind of settled, uh, but that tentative agreement. And apparently according to the PSRA, it wasn't really an agreement. It was, all right, we're just going to take this offer. We don't agree to it or anything. We're going to put it to a vote. And uh, 95.8% rejected. Uh, and so as a response, Pro has locked out the rest of these. Uh, this did include some revenue increases. Um, it was like 15. I find the range is really interesting. It's like seven. It's like, well, 75 to 104% for assistant referees. So that's significant. That's Yep. And then it's like 15 to 100%. For video referees. So there must be men. some v- video official referees that are not make, taking money, like that are like volunteer referees. <laughs> I guess so. Because uh, that's the only way it could be. I doubt it. They're just doubling their salary. Yeah. I- increase fees for the regular season. Um, an increase. Uh, there's a bunch of 7% for match fees, a bunch of different things. Uh, they also will get first in business class. The proposal was first in business class for the playoffs and M- MLS Cup. And I think also they said decision day, decision day in 2027, 2028. My, and again, this is where I, I think this is where, according to what we've what we've read, I think that's what the referees mostly were like. Come on, you can you can give us first in business class for it seemed you know. to me like it was about scheduling as about quality of life stuff. So that's part of that is travel. But part of that is like, you know, when do I get to come in? Mm-hmm. Uh, like how many, how day, how many, how early can I get into the games so that I'm not flying in the day of, uh, you know, I, I originally saw all these numbers and I was like, well, I don't really know what they were hoping for or expecting. But then when I see a 96% reject of the proposal, it puts me much more in the camp. Like, all right, well, so clearly things are very bad for referees here that they would not have done that because, uh, I, I think it says two things. One, things are not good. And two, that a lot of these people are not making all their like life uh, money from from refereeing because of this that are able they're having to like have other jobs they're not some people usually they usually will sign a bad deal sometimes when they're in an economic precarity situation or don't have money you know have money coming in the whatever but i feel like this is like a resounding thing saying we want to make this our full-time profession we want to make sure that we're doing our best and improving and uh this doesn't get it done uh, to I the thing I am concerned about from their perspective is that things go fine with the, with the uh, with the replacement referees that tends to chip away at your uh, at your leverage you have in these conversations. Uh, in the NFL's case, it fell all into the referees the 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 union's hands because it went so poorly. Uh, when the baseball strike happened and they had scab players for a low, very short time and it wasn't very good, same story there. I'm just hoping. I mean, I'm not hoping because I don't want the games to be horrible, but I am hoping that they, this does not go so dramatically against them where they find themselves wishing yeah. that they had this deal that they that they turned down. Yeah, you know, I think when we talk about I talk about mistakes, I obviously hope no one gets hurt. Um, I hope that there's nothing that happens that causes uh, you know someone to be seriously hurt. But I mean, I could see a VAR mess up a you know a a mistake in play that cannot be reviewed through VAR and it's so terrible that, you know, or, you know, there's, 
utter confusion amongst the referees. I believe they're going to be they're going to be pulling referees from all over. It sounds like they're all be VR VAR trained. Uh, we'll 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 have to wait and see. Right now, no games are being canceled. They're all going to use these replacement referees. Um, I think they're also pulling some from the upper reaches of the NCAA. I'll be curious to read the list and I'll be curious to maybe research some of these guys that are coming in. What, what, one thing I want to add, one thing I want to add is I feel like a lot of people are looking at this and they are um, a lot of them. Number one, there's been, I've seen responses of people who like your initial response that were like, were like, Hey, this is a pretty good deal. I don't know what else y'all were expecting. Um, number two, I've seen people say, well, they can't get any worse. I'm like, well, yes, it can. Um, we're not the referees. We don't do this job. We don't interact with this. We have no, a lot of us have no basis to look at this and say, this is a good deal or this is the best they can get. These referees, I I feel like in a lot of this, in a lot of this nature, it's been, it's been very interesting to watch some of the reactions of people when they talk about this and, and just how much they feel like the referees should just take what they can get. And we would never say this about the players. We would never, we would always want the players and it like, we need to start treating these respect. And if we treat these referees better, if we make it a more viable profession, if we help grow it, if we make it better for them, then maybe they will do better. Like, and have you ever, you can toss them out. Yeah. If they suck then, right. If they're, if they're flying first class everywhere and they get, and they're making like commensurate wages with the, with, you know, international refereeing and they suck, then they got to go. So it's like, yeah. it's like a, it's like a, if you pay them, if you pay, if the expectations are professional, then the conduct's professional and the output is professional. I think the struggle, like the point you made, you're, you're able, you have a different lens because of, you know, your I've actually done it and, and it's hard done it, and it's hard. <laughs> the challenge for fans is no one watches MLS or any sport for the referees. They are like, they're the requirement for the thing to happen. But like, it's almost, they only exist insofar as they make you mad, right? That's the, and it is, it's like, it's like, if you, if you've noticed a referee, if you know their name, it's usually a bad thing. You're not like, I love Greg. I love watching him referee. His matches are always wonderful. Unless you're a referee yourself. And then you're like, you know, you get it. You, you're, 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 you're the, you get, but everyone else in the world, like, oh my God, it's that guy again. He sucks. So it's hard. Like it, it, I think that that certainly explains the differential in like how they're being treated and it sucks from their perspective. And also it can't, it's like playing soccer without the soccer ball. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it is in fact a requirement for the game to, to, to ex- exist and proceed. So they got to figure out how to be consistent about that or a little bit more consistent anyway. Yeah. And, and you're right. I view it through a lens. I, I just, for some, for someone like me, I don't know what people what people expect. Like I, I really, that that's where, that's where it really gets me. And I was having a conversation with, with somebody and, you know, he was showing support he's like, yeah, well, I don't think they're that great, but, and I'm like, yeah, number one, they're, let's talk about these, these guys are humans. So they're going to make mistakes. They have an incredibly difficult job. The laws as themselves written right now are a mess. It's an absolute mess right now. Handling is all over the place. IFAB has completely screwed it up in my mind. They, they have made it so difficult now to to figure out what's handling what's not that it's always going to be inconsistent they have not done the referees any favors i i think i think when you look at it the quality of refereeing in mls has gotten better it's just nobody wants to look at it because they're all going to talk about well this this call in this game i it was 50 50 and the referee went with this decision i think that was a wrong decision and they screwed my team that's what everybody's going to think so i i think this this is a a lose-lose as far as every that's what everybody's going to think no one thinks refereeing is getting better these guys who make that level have to go through incredible amounts of scrutiny. They have to go through numerous times, even just to advance from where I am, which is right now grassroots referee. I'm right at the bottom of the barrel. I am not going to be refereeing professional games anytime soon. I don't have any 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 desire to do that right now in, my, in this time point in my life. I'm happy just to go out there, do my high school, do my you know rec and and some of my other games. Um, but you know those to, even just to jump up a level. I have to, just to give you a sense of like what I have to do, I have to, number one, I have to go referee adult level, uh, adult level games. So 90 minutes, adult level games. I have to think I do a center and I have to have a I have to have assessments for that center. I also have then to run, have to pass a fitness test. I have to run like a seven minute mile. So I have to pass the fitness test. There's different camps you have to go to where you get assessments. And then you have to keep that up. Even just to stay at that level, you have to keep that up year after year. So right now, if I live in Lynchburg, I would have to travel to Richmond on a Sunday go and do uh do adult level sort of you know 
Sunday league type games in order to keep my, so it is incredibly stressful that these play, people go through it. And again, what always frustrates me is none of them want to go out. None of them, no, no one here wants to go out and do it. They all want to criticize. They don't want to actually go out and do it. So it's called thankless for a reason. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. It just, it gets, it gets me, it gets me on the thing. I think we should support the referees. I stand with them. I hope, I hope they get the good deal. I hope that, I hope that everybody's safe, but I hope this weekend shows you know what it i hope maybe this gives some moment there's some moment where they say wow you know maybe you know maybe ted uncle's not that bad maybe he actually does do some good things because you know this guy they this scab they brought in is just not cutting it today so i want christian benteke to grab the ball and throw it in the net like he's playing european handball and then the replacement <laughs> ref to say it's okay and then we win one nothing that's all <laughs> i will see um yeah it's going to be interesting uh and then of course uh so again Keeping Pretty up with the bad, 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 bad vibe central, bad vibe central. Uh, we all thought the U.S. Open Cup, Cup drama was stopped. I have had, you know, God bless, uh, God bless the guy that runs the cup U.S. But he has been saying, look, it's, you know, U.S. soccer denied it. It's we're going forward. Apparently, that's not been the case. Apparently, MLS is is sort of digging their heels in and they are saying we are not competing. We are not doing this as we always do it. Um, they are basically from what we've heard, holding the U.S. Open Cup hostage and uh uh, this was on the Hudson River Blue. Uh, I have to find the article of the person who wrote it, and I just found it out. But uh, go check that out. Go just go to Hudson River Blue, read it. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Uh, more specifically, that U.S. Soccer has talked about canceling the tournament as a whole. Um, and in fact, the USL had an emergency, an emergency meeting where they said it looks really bleak. Um, there's been some proposals that have put out. There's been some talk about sharing gate receipts with MLS. So basically, if you know DC were to travel to Richmond, they would get 40 percent of those gate receipts. So I mean they are I mean they are pulling out all the stops to yeah that, again capitalism wins man the the, the spirit of the cup is dead <laughs> yeah we're Appar- gonna get our we're gonna get our money out of this yeah apparently MLS uh, says they only want eight teams to participate there so I guess that would be what the eight teams that didn't make the playoffs I don't know how they determine that we're in baby <laughs> I don't know how they determine that I. So, I mean, there is, and they, I think what they've also tried to do, they've tried to basically, we will have eight teams in the tournament. If you recall at one point, and I don't know if you do, I think around 2011, I think it was, it used to be not all teams were in the tournament proper it, in MLS. There was like a qualifying tournament where they kind of had like a quick knockout game. And then the winners of those knockout games then made it to the actual tournament proper. And then the teams that finished high enough in the standings were, you know, were also in it. So it, it was a very different sort of setup for the tournament. Um, yeah, this is bad vibes central. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people, you know, wanting U.S. soccer to pull their Division One sanctioning. Apparently, I, the, the Hudson River Blue article seems to indicate that this would this would aid the NASL in their antitrust lawsuit. And I think that that is the the primary focus of why they are U.S. soccer is is nervous because uh, any the people the remnants of the NASL are watching this with bated breath because this is. We're already we'll get we'll get into a little bit when we talk about women's soccer about some of the things that I think are kind of trying to build their case right. that yes our division sanctions are fine don't worry about it you know the but, Open Cup is not worth it to U.S. soccer to have everything else fall apart like they yeah. love the they love the cup but uh, it still I think costs them more money than than it makes so from their perspective like well we're gonna cut this then <laughs> I don't want an ASL to be able to sue us into oblivion so uh, whoops fine yeah. whatever you want MLS yeah and I mean they're in a I mean, they're in a tough shop. Yeah, MLS has the money. They have the weight. They have the financial weight. They want to do this League's Cup thing. Everybody talks about how it's money. I, I feel like there there should be a solution here. And the solution, the solution, the obvious solution is MLS needs to. I, I just don't understand why MLS is so hesitant. Just the fix oh, is so easy. Open up fix your rosters. <laughs> open up your rosters just for U.S. Open Cup game. Just for the Open Cup. Say you extend your roster to 32. You can bring in academy players. You can bring on whatever the deal. And then that, that's it. But they don't they don't lose they don't lose any other provisioning. They don't have to mm-hmm. be paid throughout the year. They don't need benefits. None of those things. Short term emergency loans, basically. And then let the team play it how they want to. If they use the end of their roster against a, a, re, a reasonable USL championship club, they're probably going to lose. Like that's not yeah. like if you're if you're drawn up against if you're I mean if it's Flower City or whatever. Like maybe not. But there's a certain standard. If you get drawn to them, if you don't take it seriously, you'll lose. And that's yeah. Fine. I mean, it's clear. It's clear. This is retribution from from Major League Soccer. I think this is retribution from what happened with the with the original deal where they're like, well, we're going to put our next pro teams in there. 
And we're, th- those are what, that's what we're going to do. And U.S. soccer was like, no, you're not going to do that. We d- we deny that request. And like, oh, okay, then we're going to make it exceedingly difficult. We, we like, we really do not want our team. We tried to be nice. We that's tried right. to be that nice. Was and that, that was us being nice to you. <laughs> that was us being nice to this tournament. Now, now we're going to get, now we're going to get upset. So now we're going to destroy it. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's bad. I, I, I hate it. And I, at this point, it's like, I mean, we'll, we'll wait and see. This is, this story is getting very interesting. I'll be curious to see. There was a lot of fervor when, when MLS originally announced this. I'll be curious to see if that fervor, if that type of uh, fervor returns and there are people upset about it. So, all right. We don't have much women, much uh, Washington spirit news to discuss. Um, really nothing. King uh, has, I believe, has now finalized the, pur- the purchase of Olympic Leones, the, the, the female, uh, the women's team. Uh, no, she has said no major brand changes, no changes right now. She wants to get, I think, a training center built for them. She wants to have a better, better situation for them. Sorry. Don't worry, Leon. You've got two seasons before you're going to be uh, highlighter, highlighter yellow, <laughs> black and yellow. Yeah, we will have kits. We'll have a kit reveal soon for for the spirit. It's not it's not going to look good. Uh, but we did have some some sort of pretty interesting news um, in regards to women's soccer. The USL Super League, which is going to be their women's league, originally supposed to be a D2 league, but they've decided to go after Division One sanctioning and M- US soccer has granted it to them. Um, again, conspiracy hat for me goes on. I feel like, yes. So so right now there is a team going to be in Washington, D.C. They are probably going to play in Loudoun, which is very, mm-hmm. very far. From, very, very far from Washington, D.C. Um, so they will not be playing at Audi Field. I think this is I think this is also this is part of aiding uh, their antitrust lawsuit that says, look, like, you know, if you meet the standards and we say you meet the standards, we have no problem with two division one leagues and ESL. You, you just did not meet the standards. So, you know, Silliness. go, go home, <laughs> go home. I would love it. It all is going to come down to what these rosters look like. Right. Mm-hmm. I think I said I think I said somewhere I think it might have been on discord. Like if they are pulling players that couldn't make NWSL rosters in Loudoun, they're going to draw like 250 people a game and a yeah. hundred, a hundred of them are going to be friends and family of the players. So this is all, this is all sort of kind of silly. I think in the, in the, at least if you're, if you're looking at cities that have multiple professional soccer teams in, located in them, I don't know what you're hoping to accomplish. I, I it just seems like a strange decision uh, to do. Although, I mean, you know, that what's, I guess let's give them a chance. Let's see what they, they, they come yeah. up with. They, this is, from my understanding, this team is also partially owned by a firm sports, which owns Loud United. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a coalition. That's why they're probably at Segra potentially. I just want to see what these rosters look like. That's what it all, that's what it all comes down to. Yeah. If, if, if they sign a bunch of like, like college players that couldn't get drafted, it is a division one team league in name only, right? It's, it's mm-hmm. it, nothing else about it is division one when you look at NWSL. Yeah. And it'd be, it'd be curious to see, I think, I think a lot what a lot of people have said, I think if this league had come out two, three years ago, I think you would and, and they and they got some money behind it and some investment behind it. I could have seen them maybe pulling some big names away from, you know, Kristen Press, let's get you out of Chicago here. Why don't, or let's get you out of the the mess that was Chicago at the time and let's get you onto one of our teams. We'll, we'll treat you well. We want you there. You kind of kind of launched immediately when the athletic report came out. Oh, yeah. They should have like just press release out like uh, we're starting next week, guys. <laughs> we're we're going to go next week. But now you've seen you've seen the and the and, and the league truly was struggling for investment as well. But now you've seen yep. a lot of that change. Teams are now getting their own stadiums. The NWSL is now on such a small, a strong footing. I think I think this was I wonder sometimes whether this was US. They went to US soccer, what it would take to be division one. And they were like, you know what? You know, put forward your best effort. Make it look good. We're going to give you D1 sanctioning. This will help us in a number of ways of showing right. that, that we it actually have nothing hold... to do with this women's soccer at all in any way, but it is in fact helps us. For I think they're going to start off. I think, like you said, if unless they pull off some sort of huge heist and they grab a player that maybe we weren't expecting, you know, then we'll see. But I think eventually that league is then going to say, OK, uh, we're just going to go back to we're going to go back and be, be a D2 league We're we're totally and that'd be it. fine. And that's good. There's I would love or and, and it would be great if NWSL teams could have reserve teams in those leagues mm-hmm. similar to the USL, whatever, who cares? Uh, Adrian Gonzalez, assistant coach, of the Washington Spirit has finally arrived in California for training. So that's good. Now they actually have a coach that will be there long term and is actually a real coach for them. Uh, so it's still been, you know, there's not much going on out there in California. It's been raining, uh, camp continues. They still have, I think like, a, when's, when's first kick for the spirit. Do we know that? 
March Quick week. Yeah, is it wow. March? This is really this is really good. Uh, really good stuff. Yeah, we, well, we've been we, googling googling. Uh, we 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 we've been in we've been in DC mode for a while. March seventeenth is kickoff. They'll be out so almost against a whole Seattle month. Almost mm-hmm. a whole month. Uh, so are there preseason games also listed on there? I believe there are a couple that they've got planned. I don't believe any of them are uh, available to the open or streamed me- media <laughs> or streamed because apparently that's again who would want to do that? Certainly not podcasters would hate that. You know, you know what's you know it's you know what I feel like. What I feel like MLS, MLS, NWSL should do, and maybe it's just too expensive. Come up with like four satellite camps. You you know how they do the media day and everything. They do like the mm-hmm. media day. Combine that with some preseason games. Get like a whole MLS fest to welcome everybody back. Move the teams there. Cover it so no one has to pay for it. And just like just show something to like get some people excited about like the games. Have some interviews. Try some new things with your Apple TV broadcast. That might be might be that, worth so trying. That would have been you could have you could have local podcasters do like a small segment <laughs> of the game. Do a fan zone thing. Like a you know, go crazy. Zone. Who knows? What the article I read that was like the the quality is so poor often in the preseason that the only thing that was coming out of a video of broadcasting the preseason games was clips of horrible goalkeeper mistakes in preseason and then that just being the joke and they'd be like we paid to have this negative uh free media basically and they're like you know what screw it there's only 250 people want to watch us anyway it's all it's all downside risk for us it's not nothing's up and it's i listen ted i agree with you man i i, I want it too i'd watch all of them i'm mm-hmm. watching college baseball ted i clearly <laughs> i mean i'm clearly have a gap in my sports watching life i would love to be watching them all this preseason I watched all the stupid inner Miami games because it was on Apple TV and it was available. But yeah, you know, it's just it's it's something we want, but it doesn't make dollars and cents. Yeah. But sense. but I mean, maybe NWCL can do the same. I know they kind of have the Challenge Cup as kind of their big preseason thing. That's now no more. So I don't know. Just like a, a, a just get the teams in one location. You can do your media stuff. You can do you can do a lot of that stuff, and you can also combine it with some games. One um, of the camps can be in Saudi Arabia. Half, the, half the, a quarter of the teams want to go there anyway. I don't know. Maybe we'll see that change for a, for both leagues. But all right, folks, I think that's going to do it. We got an hour we long show. A, yep, hour long show. Album recommendation thing. I'm starting. I did it on the Friday show. I'm doing it now. The album is "People Who Aren't There Anymore" by Future Islands. It just came out last week. It's really good. If you haven't heard Future Islands before, they're a Baltimore band. They've been around forever. If you haven't heard of them, uh, just look Future Islands. Dave Letterman. Uh, and watch the performance of a song, like I think of two albums ago. That should make you a fan, I think. That's all I'll say. A very astute recommendation, and I feel like you're paying homage to uh, the Washington Spirit team, which has several people that are no longer there anymore. <laughs> that's gonna be the that's gonna be the uh, the the episode title now. People who aren't there anymore. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you guys so so much for listening again. patreoncom slash Um We're gonna we're gonna we're still like hacking out some content. I've I've got a piece uh, just to give you a little teaser. I'm gonna have a, a whole preseason piece. I've already asked for prediction. From John and 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 the guy and Brian as well to get uh, to get some predictions out, uh, more more your generic golden boot assist type predictions, but also have some discussion and just some overall thoughts on how I think the team is going to do and and some things to watch for this year. So definitely, if you've if you kind of like have been away from the team for some of you, it might just be old news, you guys that you sickos. But if you've kind of been dipping in and out, maybe you haven't been paying attention to everything. I think it's a maybe a good refresher on, on what to expect for the team. All I need to remember is the time I went to a game at the beginning of I think last season, and there was someone was like, "Where's Bill Hamid?" And I was like, "Yeah, you gotta, you gotta reiterate yeah. for folks they are not <laughs> paying attention as much as you think they are." So yeah, and that's and that should also be the notion of why MLS thinks they can get away with stuff that they're getting away with right now, and why DC mm-hmm. thinks they can get away with the stuff they're getting mm-hmm. away with right now. Short memories. Uh, thank you guys again. We will check. We will be back next week with an actual game to watch and some analysis. Mm-hmm. So it should be fun. Vamos, vamos. Thank you for listening to RFK Refugees Podcast. Make sure you rate and review the show wherever you download podcasts. If you want to support the show, consider joining our Patreon or subscribing to our channel on Twitch. Lastly, make sure you're following us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Threads, YouTube, Twitch, Goals.TV, Friendster, MySpace, and Tumblr. Some of those are even real. Vamos. Vamos.